Uh, so hey everybody, my name is Rob Wormald. I'm a developer advocate, that's not true. I'm a developer programs engineer on the Angular team at Google. Uh, thanks for having me, Oleg and Ninja Seattle. I've come up here a bunch of times to talk to you, so I work with, yeah. with Black White quite a lot. Um, I'm here at Build doing talks on elements. So I didn't bring my slide deck, so I may just wander all over the stage and make a fool of myself. Um, but I'll see if I can use Stackblitz to kind of get the idea across of what we were talking about at Build and hopefully build a demo that doesn't blow up in my face a little bit. Um, so Angular users in the room, are you all Angular users? I don't have to explain to you what Angular is from the beginning, good, okay. So um, Angular historically has been built for like single page applications, right? It's what we've been doing for a long time. It's what we get paid to do at Google. The reason we have a salary and a project at all is because we build these big SPAs inside of Google. So like getting paid at Google, getting your performance review done, ordering anything, ordering any swag, all that stuff is typically done through Angular applications. So Angular is really good at that, and I think we've been getting better and better, and it's what we really spent most of our time focusing on is this, this single page application case. It turns out, though, that that's not the only kind of application that exists, right? And if you were an AngularJS developer, you know, we had this idea kind of back in the day of AngularJS where you could have a service that rendered page, you could have a static HTML page, you could drop Angular onto it and kind of enhance the page, right? Sort of do dynamic things and just enhance little bits of the page. And we took some of that away for some very good reasons. A lot of that to do with performance and security and doing compilation on the browser is kind of a sketchy idea. But in part of my part of my job is kind of going out in the world and you know hanging out at BlackRock and talking to teams. And we keep hearing this feature request from people. Look, I, you know, I don't want to do anything as an SPA necessarily. I have a different use case. Maybe I have half a dozen frameworks and I have people using React and I have people using Vue and people using JS. Um, and so about a year ago, we really kind of started, I would like to say we started listening, but we started thinking about this problem <laughs> a little more deeply. Um, and it turns out that like this is not a unique idea, right? And people at Google have been thinking about this problem for a while. And so uh, raise your hand if you've heard of a web component, if you know the term web components, half of you or so. Have you ever written one? Couple of people, kind of, maybe. Um, so, Web Component is this: is it's a set of browser APIs the Chrome team proposed almost five years ago now. If you know Polymer, Polymer is written entirely using Web Components. These Web Components APIs, and it turns out that there's a lot of benefits to be able to build sort of uh, framework-style things that use the power of something like Angular, but also work like Web Components do: work like a button, work like a div, work like a span. Um, and kind of do little things a little more progressively and have the ability to kind of sprinkle functionality into a page, really good components that work everywhere, not just components that work inside of Angular applications, right? So the Web Component API was proposed, I don't know, four or five years ago. Polymers are doing re really well with it, but there are something like one-tenth as many Polymer users as there are Angular users, something like one-twentieth as many Polymer users as, as React users. And so unfortunately, like, Web Components haven't necessarily taken off. Right. And I have a lot of, I could babble and babble and babble about why that is, and I'd get in trouble with a bunch of people, so I'm not going to do that. Um, but it turns out that like the low-level primitives of web components, and especially the one I want to talk about is custom elements, there's a lot that actually is very useful from them. And so about a year ago, we really started looking in earnest, could we integrate Angular with web components? You can actually already use Polymer components inside of an Angular app because a Polymer component is just a DOM element, right? It works just like a button or a div or a span. Um, and so we've always been able to consume web components, but when you write an Angular component, you know, it looks like a web component, it looks like it's a DOM element, but it's really not. And really what we're doing is kind of, we have this JavaScript class that you're writing, your Angular component, and we sort of glue them together, we bootstrap them, and we say you have this component, and you have this DOM element, and we sort of connect them together in abstract, right? And so again, that works really well for like the SPA case, right? Any kind of standard app where there's like this one has you know, just the one kind of main content area on the page. Let's see if I can make it a little bigger. Yeah. But who knows what happens if I do this, right? So I want to have two of these on the page. It doesn't change, right? Because really what's happening under the hood when we bootstrap Angular is we're saying to Angular, I have this component, go find me a DOM element that is this, you know, this app thing, this app root on the page, and glue them together. But I'm only telling it to do that once, right? Angular's querying for the first one it finds, it connects up to that. So the second one doesn't work. So 
you think it acts like a web component, you think it's a DOM element, but it's really not. And so you get in this sort of funny, uncanny valley of like this thing is supposed to work this way, but it doesn't, right? And the other thing is if you have you know, an element like this that's got an input, so if, imagine if our uh, app component here had something like an uh, input name. You know, if you're using this thing inside of an Angular template, you know, this would work. If this uh, index.html is an Angular template, I could go in here and say name Rob, right? But if nothing happens, because Angular doesn't know anything about this attribute. It's not listening to that. They're not really connected at the end of the day, right? Again, we're sort of remote controlling this DOM element, if you like. The other sketchy thing is that if you actually take this out and you don't have anything on the page, and we look at our console, Angular's gonna explode because it goes looking for this element and doesn't find it, right? And so what I'm trying to get across here is that we're sort of faking web components, and we have been faking web components for quite a long time, and in most cases, this doesn't matter, nobody really cares, right? But there are a lot of cases, and this sort of, you know, I have a, I have a server side rendered page that I want to put a bunch of different widgets on, or I have, you know, anything that we're going to be controlling layout from outside of Angular, it doesn't really work today, right? So in V6, we released this project called Angular Elements. It's kind of my baby. It's been I'm working on for the past year or so. Um, there's a much better talk where I'm much better prepared at ng-conf that you can watch. So I actually going to do a better job of explaining this to everybody. But the basic idea is we want to take an Angular component and effectively export it, publish it as a web component so that it works as you would expect it to, as you think it works already, right? And that gives you the ability to drop this thing into any environment, any web page, any application, any framework. And because it is just a DOM element, because it works just like any other button or div or span, anybody can consume this at this little baby sort of widget app component, whatever, use it in a context, and not have to know anything about how Angular works. Right? So I'll see if I can build a demo that, that is not going to blow up on my face here and kind of get the idea across here. And, and really, this is a new project for us. We've just released in 6.0. We're using it on Angular.io, so maybe this will make it a little bit more intelligible when I'm babbling around about here. So, the Angular website. This is an Angular application, right? It wouldn't be very cool if we were shipping a website that wasn't using the technology that we build, right? <laughs> but interestingly, this app is basically an app shell. So like the outside container here, so like the toolbar up there at the top, that's Angular components, right? But if we actually go into the documentation here and look at one of these docs, this is all static HTML, right? There is no reason to turn this stuff into a component. It doesn't make sense to do that because it's not dynamic, right? You're not clicking on buttons, you're not interacting with the page. It's static HTML, and static HTML is really good at rendering static content. That's what it's for, right? But when you look at a page like any of the Angular docs, we have these kind of embedded nested widgets. So this thing here is actually an Angular component. It does styling, it has some kind of wiring up. Somewhere in here I won't be able to find one on the fly. We have like a tab container that you can switch between two different tabs to look at the code. So we have all this static HTML content, and then we have these little islands, embedded widgets of interactivity. Right? So previous to the Elements project, we had something like a thousand lines of code that every time we change one of these pages, so I go from some link to some link, you know, we would render this HTML, and then we have to go crawl all the HTML and find all the little embedded Angular widgets and manually do that connection step, right? Where we say, take this component and kind of connect it to this DOM element. So it works, you can do it, you can do this today, but it's not easy. And for our docs authors, most of them who are not hardcore Angular developers, it was confusing, it was hard to use, right? And this case we hear about all the time. Any CMS that you've built does a very similar thing, right? You have people writing static HTML, people doing layouts, and you want this interactivity but you, know, you, you don't want to have to learn basically this kind of gory Angular bootstrapping code, right? Like this, if you're an Angular developer, is hard enough to know. If you're not an Angular developer, you have no hope of understanding how to use this. And I can't do this from memory most of the time. So the yeah, idea of the Elements project is to really get kind of the best of both worlds, and that is all the good stuff that Angular gives you, forms and routing and HTTP and all this stuff we bake in, but allow you to expose it, use it, share it with the world for people who may not be Angular developers, who may not be doing the SPA case, who may be doing something that's not totally kind of the Angular standard of doing things, right? And so we shipped this new library, and I hope this works because we're on 6.0, so maybe it will. I'm going to install this new Angular Elements library here. I'm going to do a couple of things. Um, so I have to get a little polyfill. This is what I was going to yell at Eric about, but I guess he's gone, so we'll skip over giving a hard time about that. <laughs> just send an issue to his GitHub repo. 
So uh, this is really neither here nor there, but what I'm grabbing is a little shim that allows me to use ES5 because uh, I can't spell web components. Web components. Yeah, cool. Yes, OK. So this, uh, this actually allows me to use ES5 code, which is coming out of Stackblitz, as ES6, which is what the custom elements API requires. So this is just like a little polyfill. Uh, Maxim mentioned the ng add thing during his talk. We have ng add at Angular Elements. We'll set all this stuff, stuff up that I'm doing right now. It's all kind of automated. I have to do it the manual way on Stackboards or something. So we'll do it the hard way. Uh, so basically, what I've got right is again, I've got my kind of standard Angular application here. I haven't changed anything. And what we're going to do is change how we bootstrap this slightly. So I'm going to go to my app component here. My app module, apologies. And normally what we do, right, is we say, okay, we've got our you know, things that we depend on, we've got our actual components that we're declaring and building, and then we say to Angular, bootstrap this component. And the bootstrap, when we're talking about bootstrap, what we mean is go find that div, that whatever that's on the page, and kind of connect Angular to it. This is what we refer to as bootstrapping. And so what we're going to do is just comment this out. Actually, I'll change this. So rather than bootstrapping it, we're going to change that to entry components. And this just helps Angular make this thing available to be used externally. Make this thing as something I can get a hold of. And so what's going to happen here is it's not automatically going to bootstrap. You can see it automatically throws an error at me and says, hey, idiot, you forgot to bootstrap, right? So you're probably doing something wrong. So I can go in here and just implement the ng do bootstrap method. We're not going to do anything here for the moment. This will stop Angular from complaining. What's actually happened here is if you like, we've started up the module, the app, but we haven't rendered any components. We're not actually connecting any UI. Right? We've kind of started this invisible Angular content, which is the module, but we're not doing anything yet. And then what I do is go back to my main here. So again, we are you know, getting our platform here. We're bootstrapping that module. It's giving us back this module ref. This is the instance of that module. And I get rid of this. And really what I say now is, and I actually need to turn off one other thing. Set this back to manual page reloading. So what I've got is like a, an invisible injector running, right? And now all I have to say is go and get this new library. Um, work on this project. I should be able to spell it. Elements. And there's one API here. Create that element. What we're basically going to do is grab our component. somebody else's keyboard. So we're going to say uh, create custom element. We're going to pass the app component. And this create custom element method, all it does is kind of generate this, this DOM element wrapper. This generates the native custom element and kind of glues everything together. I'm going to pass that the injector that I just got out of the ref.injector. And so this connects it to Angular's uh, internal DI system. This lets you share services. If you want to have HTTP plugged into this little widget, you can do that. And what comes out of here is my app elements. And so we're basically just returning to you an ES6 class. We've kind of created a class expression behind. We've handed it back to you. This is now just an ES6 class. And effectively, under the hood, what we're doing is saying class extends HTML elements. This is how you define a web component in the standard web component APIs. We're doing that internally for you. And I'm just going to register this with the browser using the custom elements API. So I can say, Custom elements, this is baked in, as you can see. Define my app. I'm going to pass that element. And at this point, the Angular component is wrapped in this custom element. We've told the browser, the native browser API, treat this ES6 class as a uh, custom element, as a web component. So now it's available in the browser. I can go back into my index.html here. Put my, what did I call that thing? Uh, my app, good. Go back in here and say my app. And now you can see it will automatically go ahead and start up. Everything's working as I expect it to. But now I can go in here and say my app again. I should get two of them. And what's happening here is rather than Angular starting up, looking for a DOM element and connecting it to it, the DOM element is starting up and booting Angular up inside of it. Right. So we just kind of inverted the way that everything starts up. 
And that seems like a simple change, but it actually kind of changes everything about how you can use Angular now, right? Because once you've minted these components, once you've registered them, literally all you have to do to use them is put them on the page, right? And to the point now, that if I open this up in a new window, I can actually go to my dev tools here. And I should just point out, let's go back to our component here. This component has an input, right? An input is, in abstract sense, here's some data coming in from the outside world that I want you to deal with, right? And typically, an Angular template from the outside world, you would pass props down through it. But because custom elements, like divs and spans and buttons, they already have this API, right? You can set attributes on an element, you can set properties on an element. All we do internally is we glue these things up. So we've got this input on our component, we read that as we do it, and we now basically set up the browser APIs to connect to these things. So I can go in here, go back to my index page. I can say name ng Seattle. I can say name Rob. And then you left that watch the work. Maybe, maybe refresh. You crashed it, so we'll yell at Eric again. <laughs> Cool, so you can see it actually work. And now I can actually get into my dev tools and I can mess with these exactly as you'd expect them to be able to as if it was a div or a span or a button. So I can go into my dev tools and screw with this thing. And now they are linked up, right? Now this thing works exactly like you expect it to work as if it was a div, a span, or a button, right? This is kind of the promise of web components. Uh, and now I can do all kinds of fun things. And the point here is I've got this up and running and now we're completely outside of Angular. Now, anybody who knows how to use DOM, how to use HTML, can do all sorts of fun things. So I can go in here and say, you know, const nl is document.create elements, my dash app. And again, this is a totally standard browser API. This is how Angular under the hood creates DOM elements. This is how everybody creates DOM elements. And then I can just say document.body.append child nl starts up, starts running. I can set properties on it. So nl.name is Rob. I can set attributes on it, and L dot set attributes uh, name is Rob, and that works too. And then the inverse is actually true, right? So if I were to go back to my component here, and I add as an output an event emitter event to the have a beer before I came up. <laughs> <laughs> So we'll add an output, and again, this is totally standard. You've all done this inside of Angular apps. Name change, the new event emitter. And then if I go to my template, and I say, here's a button. Okay. Say on click, go ahead and do a name change dot emit whatever. Right. So now what I've said is exactly it's like the inverse of what we do with inputs, browser events, buttons, whatever, they fire these native events, right? This is what you're using when you bind the click handler or the drag handler or any of these things. They're just native browser events. The Elements API wires these things up as well. So I can go back in here, keep crashing that. And now if I go in here and I say document, document, dot query. Selector, I don't know why it's not completing anymore. My app. We need documents not defined. Am I spelling document wrong? This is Eric Simmons again with his little stack. <laughs> documents there, okay. Documents are query selector. Let's say my dash app. Give that a ref. And now I can do the standard again, add event listener, name change, so the name of the event that I'm using here, trying to use here, is the same as the events we defined in our component, so this name change, right, matches up with the name of the event we're gonna spit out from the outside world. And then I can say, I'll just log that event out. Let me do something with it. Hopefully, a quick button here. We'll see it fires off these native events. Right? So what we're doing is taking this kind of completely angular thing that you all know how to use, and really just wrapping it up in such a way that anybody who knows how to use the web at all 
can consume these things. Right? So that's the basic promise of this. And we're using at Angular.io for a couple of use cases already. The first question that everybody's going to ask, and just preempt it immediately here, is well, how big are these things, right? Because it makes sense if you want to ship a whole Angular application out this way. It makes sense that you don't really care on Angular.io. We've already got Angular running on the page, right? So who cares? It's not a big deal. Um, right now, they're bigger than they should be if you wanted to build like a date picker and ship it out to the world. That's kind of probably slightly too large right now to do that. The other thing the Angular team is working on that maybe you've heard about, talked about a lot at ng-conf, this is the idea of Ivy, which is our new rendering engine. Um, I could talk about Ivy for another two hours, but I won't. Uh, the big thing about Ivy is that it's designed to be incredibly small, like extremely, extremely small. People ask me how small. I can remember the name of my little project here. I think it's Ivy to do NDC Firebase app dot Maybe a dash in there. <laughs> so uh, this is a two NDC application. This is exported as an Angular element. This is running on the page, just how we just demonstrated everything um, and the whole thing. If we actually look at the dev tools here, that's the entire application is coming from a memory cache. That's not very helpful. That's also coming from memory cache. You can see the whole thing is 13K. So it's a pretty tiny application. That's smaller than pretty much every framework that exists, right? So this, between six and seven, we're going to polish this up, and then by V7, so that's kind of five months out, you should be able to do what I just demonstrated on stage, compile with the IV engine and spit it out to the world and have a tiny reusable widget that works in any web framework, any browser, any page that you want. So that's the theory. Uh, I've been working on this for, I said, like a year or so. We just shipped it last week as a stable thing, so that API that I'm using, you can go try it out now, give us feedback on it. Um, we've got some ideas of the use cases we think. We have a ton of internal use cases. I'm talking to like 25 different teams at Google who are like, oh yeah, this is what we need. Every time I talk to a company, they're like, well, this is exactly what we need. Why have we been doing this for two years? That's a really good question. Um, but we think that actually this is going to be pretty cool. It's going to be really useful for a lot of people. It's going to open up a whole kind of different range of what you can do with Angular. It doesn't fundamentally change what you're doing today. If you're building big SPAs, we're not getting rid of that, right? Clearly that's going to stay around. That's our bread and butter. But we'd really like people to be able to use uh, Angular in any environment, right? On any kind of tech stack you're using in any environment without worrying about the size, without worrying about teaching everybody how to use Angular, right? The more we can stick close to web standards, the better this gets everybody. And hopefully, you only have to write one more day picker for the rest of your life, maybe, and then share that with the rest of the world, and then the world's a better place. Right? Uh, so that's the speech. Uh, come and chat me about this is something you care about, um, but you can try it out today. And as I said, uh, Ivy is about five, six months out, and we should get even cooler in Ivy. Thank you. Questions, comments, concerns? So if you're using, uh, let's say you have two things built with Angular Elements, sure. and they share 90% of the same like uh, library, mm -hmm. you know, do they interact with each other? Are they able to know about each other's, uh, you know, I don't know how to say, bundled up? Sure. So that's a good question. Um, and the short answer is, you can do whatever you want, right? So that means that if you wanted to have, use NGRX, for example, and like use NGRX to share data between two of them, you could do that. That would be perfectly reasonable. If you wanted to each one to have its own store, you could do that too. Uh, if you wanted them to like use Angular from a UMD on a script tag, so they all share the same copy of Angular, you could do that. Or like in this case that I'm doing on stage here. Uh, I have everything is being bundled and tree-shaped into this one specific element, right? So at that point, you can have multiple copies of Angular on the page. Really, it's flexible enough that we don't care. And we want it to be very conscious that, you know, whatever the situation might be that you're using it in, you're able to do that. So certain teams will have different use cases, will have different deployment requirements. We get a request to, like, I want to not redeploy my application, but I want to be able to drop a new script tag on the page because I have one of 500 teams who might have deployed a new thing. That would be possible as well. So the short answer is, Yes, the long answer is yes, it's up to you. Um, but you should be able to do whatever you want with it. So are you able to, like let's say we're going to build a header component mm -hmm. uh, and ship it as an Angular element. Uh, is it possible to basically say, I either want to include the bundled up dependencies it has, or I don't want to yeah. include? Okay. And so the CLI today kind of bundles them all into a unit. Angular CLI does this by default, because again, Angular CLI was built for SPAs, where you want like a binary, for lack of a better term, right? Uh, you can eject and drop into Webpack, or like System.js can do this. And really what you're saying is use Angular's global version, so like ng.core, and then all these elements could just depend on that. So yeah, 
completely up to you and very possible. Is there a good doc or resource <laughs> on exactly? So the, the thing we focused on for six uh, is documented, and so like that's the Angular I.O. case where I already have an Angular application running, and I want to kind of enhance these things. Uh, we very purposely decided between before we implemented this that we didn't want to go all the way down the path of building all of the tooling for the like shareable data picker case, uh, but that's what we'll be working for seven. For V7, we'd expect you to be able to do that baked into Angular CLI. Uh, right now, you can do it, but it's going to require you to get into the guts of Webpack and do a little bit. So the only browser that hasn't shipped native support for this is Edge, unfortunately, and of course IE, we're That's never going to ship this. Um, I got to on stage three hours ago at Edge, which was kind of a build, which is sort of fun to be able to like, your browser that I'm here talking about didn't ship this API. <laughs> um, our hope is, is that, again, like they've been around for a long time, Firefox and Safari, and Safari shipped them six months ago or so, uh, Chrome shipped them for a long time. Our hope is that the Edge team goes, oh, this is a bigger project than just Polymer. Maybe we should ship it, right? Uh, next week, I'm going to the SharePoint conference to talk about SharePoint and this, because this fits right into the SharePoint world, for example. Um, for browsers that don't support it, there are two sets of polyfills. You can polyfill this all the way back to IE9. Performance kind of sucks in IE9, but the performance sucks in IE9 anyway, so whatever. Uh, but those polyfills do work all the way back to IE9 if you need that capability, with the idea being that as browsers ship support for them, then, you know, you have two questions, uh, I was thinking about about the demo. Do you have any kind of a video where you create your components in Angular and consume it in something non Angular, like React or Google or whatever? Um, because it should work, right? This, this yeah, the, 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 it does work. Uh, I have a demo somewhere of me doing, let's see, but like I can Google for this. So right? if you look at the, our Angular meetup, there was uh, two months ago, there was a guy okay. from Microsoft. They are in, injecting Angular in, in, into the app. And I think there is from a cloud platform or some sort of cloud platform. You mean Angular component? And your com yes, and your component inside the uh, oh, React okay. application. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he okay. explained like all of them. And I think Rob has some couple too. I, I was going to find it on Twitter, but I'm not going to scroll through so my Twitter feed for 20 minutes. Before I go as, as I read, the, the number one candidate for me to create with a component will be something as, uh, something that looks like a, a dump component in the React world. Yeah. Like this is the ideal candidate. Because if, if we talk about the smarter component with NGRS mechanics, it, it brings the whole infrastructure behind it as well to the... I, I think there are, there are effectively, I see two main cases. The first is, as you said, the dumb component case, where you have a thing that only depends on its inputs and its outputs, right? The date picker is why I keep saying date picker. Uh -huh. It's a yeah, yeah, case yeah. for that, right? The other case, which is more interesting for like big enterprise, is I want to take an entire application or a subset of an application and package it up that way and share that with other teams, right? So. Uh, like you could take this entire to do MBC app that we built, right, and take that app which has two or three components, a couple of services, and package that thing up as a unit and allow other applications to consume that, right? So we get the question about like how do I build a dynamic bash dashboard all the time? This is the kind of thing you could build with dynamic dashboards, right? You build a bunch of elements and you just use standard HTML to compose these different views, right? You might do that with .NET on the server side and have .NET actually stamp out the page, right? and these elements kind of self bootstrap So kind of two different ends of the spectrum is where we see this happening. Uh, I do get asked a lot, like, should I immediately go and turn all of my Angular components into Angular elements? Maybe one day in the future. Uh, there is a slight bit of overhead to do this. It's, it's more or less negligible unless you're rendering 10,000 of them in a list, right? At that point, Angular will always be more efficient because we don't have to go through the native DOM API, right? So kind of anything that you know as an entry component in Angular today, is a fairly good candidate for turning into one of these kind of little things. Okay. Angular and WebAssembly, are they the same thing? Like, what is happening? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a really good question. One of the things that we, we prototyped uh, is we have this web worker implementation in Angular, where we basically have the Angular application running in a web worker. And then we're, again, like doing this remote control thing, talking to a DOM element, right? Um, and so I'm, act I'm actually prototyping at the moment a solution for AMP where we build these kind of Angular custom elements that are running on the DOM side, but your actual logic is running in a web worker, right? And basically what that gives you is, again, you can just drop this thing on the page, but actually off-thread do all the hard work and not burn through all your, you know, actually burn through cycles, because again, this whole thing is kind of single-threaded. So we can already do that, right? And that's kind of 90% of the way to what you would be doing with WebAssembly, because it's running in a different thread, you have to sort of remote control the DOM, right? 
So we don't have any immediate plans to deal with WebAssembly. <laughs> We've got enough to work to do as it is at the moment, basically. Um, but there are a couple of good demos out there already who are beginning to experiment with this. And I think uh, it's something we're paying attention to, but we don't have any kind of clear plans to do anything with yet. But we expect the community, like the community always does in Angular, because they're awesome, to beat us to the punch on this. So I expect that fully, so like Maxim will go and build the you know the thing for us long before we actually get to it. No pressure, but you know that's your next task. Is, is doing <laughs> something, so. Cool. Other questions? Good. Okay. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Okay.